Corinne, welcome to Slush. Yeah, it's great to be here. An extremely well-organized event. It's fantastic. <laughs> so what is it like being the co-founder of a 26-year-old startup? <laughs> well, it's been a hell of a journey, I can tell you that. And uh, yeah, <laughs> for any entrepreneurs here, the younger one, it's the story of resilience, I can tell you. It's uh, how to pivot. <laughs> Yes, having looked at the story of TomTom, Tom, I think the thing that strikes me is that there are three sort of key stages to the, the company's history. There, there's been the, the start and the incredible growth. Yeah. Uh, there's the fact that you disrupted an industry and then you actually got disrupted yourself. Yeah. And then how you actually pivoted again. So if you could go back to the, to the start, I think, with so many startups in the room, what was it like for you starting out, getting your idea, and then dealing with some incredible growth and success. Yeah, so we started with four people in, uh, in Amsterdam, three uh, Dutch guys and me, and uh, uh, originally we were doing it, so we were back in the early 90s when uh, computers were not so widespread and uh, we were designing very easy to use software. Uh, we were doing that for the uh, utility market in Holland. We then pivoted to B2C software. Some of you might remember the older one in the audience. Uh, the products like Scion, Palm Pilot, uh, Compaq iPax, the predecessors of the smartphone. And we were actually market leader in making applications for those, uh, for those products. And in 95, we started making maps uh, for those products. And we realized that uh, this was selling, uh, outselling any of our products 10 to 1. So uh, we kept thinking there is a better way of doing this. And uh, to cut a long story short, decided to uh, bring an all-in-one navigation. And that's in 2004. Uh, by then, we're a company of uh, 24 people. There's no VC who wanted to touch us with a barge pool. I mean, everybody thought navigation was going to come from the car. So nobody was prepared to uh, give us any money, so, uh, which was a good thing. Uh, you know, it was the old-fashioned days where you had to sell product and make money. So we put everything we had ourselves, the four founders, and, uh, and we launched the first uh, navigation system in 2005. And the thing just took off. Uh, before we knew it, we were selling a, a million products in a year, a million products in a month in a week, and in Black Friday 2008, one million product in a day. Uh, we democratized navigation, saved a lot of marriages in the process, where people uh, you know, were navigated from A to B uh, in the car. And, uh, yeah, and then arrived 2008. Well, how did you, before we get to that stage, how did you deal with such scale? Because sometimes people say to me that, that, that failure is, is something that, that can inspire and lead a company on, but how does a company deal with such rapid success, especially in a bootstrapped hardware company? Yeah, I think it's... So we went from 40 million to 1.8 billion turnover in five years, and uh, from uh, a company of started with four, about 20 people, to uh, 5,000 people after we acquired Teleatlas. I think that, to be honest, I can't remember. <laughs> it, was, uh, it, it was crazy, and uh, the key, especially the first few people you, you hire, you need to make sure when you scale at that level in a technology company, the, uh, the, the key was to uh, make sure we organize ourselves for, for growth and success, and that's very hard. And I'm sure a lot of companies uh, in the room, scaling is, is tremendously difficult. Uh, the key is really not to lose sight of the problem you're solving, so make sure that people who join the company at the management team are sharing in the passion and what you're trying to do, and then try to organize yourself as you're scaling to make sure that you know, you know who's doing what and yeah. be efficient. That's very hard. And, and how did you maintain the culture? Because one of the things that, when I speak to a lot of startups, what they say to me is, it's very hard to give up control. Yeah. This idea that you're a, you're a close-knit group of people when you start, and then you need to hire, and you need to trust people, and you need to delegate. And a lot of the time, companies, they don't want to give up that control. They, they, you know, how did you trust people to start scaling to the level that you needed to do? Well, first of all, I think the, the, the key, and it's for, the same for any company, is your management team and your founder team is very important. In our case, there was four of us, and we're all very complementary in our skill set. 
Uh, you had one person who was very good and had a strong product vision and a good financial background. You had two guys who were amazing at designing software mm. and product, very easy to use. Huh? So the, the, the success of TomTom was in that ease of mm. use. And I wasn't too bad at selling and marketing and doing pretty much everything else that the guys didn't want to do. No, only joking. <laughs> um, but so I think that's, that's, uh, so that starts there. And I think you, it's a fallacy to think that you can go without losing control. So yeah. you need to surround yourself with people you trust. And you need to uh, understand that the, the only way to grow and scale, I mean, we're now in 50 countries, is really by surrounding yourself with people you can trust to do the job for you so, and managing them well. So I think you need to relent a bit of control. But you need to keep the, uh, the vision. Mm. And I think what we always did very successfully is monopolize and, and, and get everybody on board with the problems we're trying to solve. Mm. I think sometimes when I hear a lot of startups, I'm a bit worried sometimes where they seem to be more proud about the investors they have on their board than the problem they're trying to solve. And I think the, the key is really, you know, what is it that you're trying to do with your company? And in our case, uh, we were trying to solve traffic congestion. We were trying to get real-time map making. Mm -hmm. We were trying, and today we're trying to uh, participate in the urban revolution with the autonomous driving. So following that dream and that, that passion about the problem you're solving, I think is key. And that's how you attract the right people who share your passion, and then you can trust them because they are as motivated as you are. And when you scaled, I think, looking back, a huge investment for you was the purchase of Teleatlas. Yes. Was that nearly 3 billion yeah, euros? Yeah, about 3 billion euros, yeah. And this took you from being essentially the box maker to owning the mapping software. This was a, a huge part in how you sort of scaled and, uh, as we'll come on to soon, sort of secured your, your future. But how did you integrate two firms of such size? Yeah, I, th I think what's important to understand is the rationale behind the acquisition. That's again, it's, we wanted to be virtually to completely integrated. We knew that we had a lot of uh, our customers were bringing us map changes. They were telling us where roads were closed or where there were changes. And we wanted to be able to, to have a real-time map, if you want. So, uh, and we needed that base map to be able to put the changes in it, validate them, and rebroadcast them. Same with our traffic information. So, we, when we acquired Teleatlas, there was a merging of two companies with very different business mm. culture, but at the same time with a similar goal. Mm. And I think to the, the way we could monopolize and, and get everybody to share that, that, that goal that we had uh, was a way to integrate and get the culture together. Mm. And I think the culture, in a, you know, we now have about 5,000 people, but to keep that entrepreneurial culture has been key for us. Mm. We are still, tech, and what I mean by entrepreneurial is, we take risk. A lot of the things we've done, always people have thought we were mad. But we bought our first navigation system. As I said, people didn't think it would ever work. People thought navigation would come through the car. And when we were quite till at last, people thought we were crazy. Uh, a month later, Nokia decided to acquire here, uh, the Navtech at the time. So I think the, the map was a crucial element of, of a tool that we needed to, to fulfill our, um, our level of ambition. So, uh, so that's how we, we managed along the way to, uh, to keep taking risk and to keep uh, yeah, focusing on the innovation. I think that's what kept us where we are today. I'm sure a lot of you see me here and think, well, TomTom, Tom, you guys are selling SatNav and Google is taken, has eaten your lunch. Well, actually, well, not quite. Isn't, isn't that also the nightmare that, that you created this startup, you created this global entity, and then one of the biggest tech companies came in the world and gave away a good enough version of your product for free? Yeah, that wasn't very good for us. <laughs> I mean, you know, when you, uh, you can imagine that, that's that's huge amount of disruption. Um, at the same time, uh, there are a lot of problems to be solved. I think there was a lot of consumers who wanted to have a dedicated device uh, or device that offline, huh? so you can use them without having a, a connection. So a lot of customers still like that. But we also diversified our business. We have a telematics company. And today we are really focusing that real-time, high-definition map that is going to be required for autonomous driving. Well, you sort of, in a way, you, you started to embrace the competition because for example, I know that in Apple Maps, you're a, you're a, a huge partner in that, also in Uber. Yeah. Um, and so what was it like when you realized that you were at a moment where you were no longer necessarily competing, you were more partnering, that 
you again, you had to pivot and you, you had to, to change dramatically in what you were doing. Was it a difficult thing to do? Was it a, a logical thing to do? Did you feel like you were a startup all over again? Yeah, I think we, we knew that uh, we, because a lot of it came from a very big successful technology company that was called Scion at the time, and we knew that this, this doesn't last forever. We knew that we, we had to diversify the business. So actually, we had started diversifying. We acquired a company that was making traffic information and telematics before the big disruption in 2008. So we had already diversified the business, but always with our core business of knowing the route and uh, and basically getting people from A to B in the safest possible way. I mean, whatever happens, there will always be cars. Whether there's someone in them or not, there'll be cars and they're going to need to go somewhere. And we feel we can play a very important role in that ecosystem. Mm. And that's what drives us today. And that's what's been driven us for the last 10 years. So yes, we have pivoted and we have that great big level of ambition. And so is this essentially where you see it, that, that um people still need to get from A to B. And yes. whether, it's, whether it's a car driving them itself, whether it's a person driving them itself, whether it's public transport, people will still need maps or robots will still need maps to follow. So where is the future that, that TomTom sort of looks at today when, when you go all the way back and you, you look at something such as the, uh, the, the box and then you, you look at the disruption you caused, the way that you were then disrupted yourself and then how you look towards the future. Where do you now tend to look at your, your different roles within the future, for the future of the company? So we have a huge amount of knowledge on the, on the map making. I think the people who are going to, for autonomous driving and that's globally, you're going to need to be able to map maps in real time. So it's going to be one of the technologies and you need to do this uh, in a scalable way, in a global way at the lowest cost possible. So you need to automate everything. So we've been using actually artificial intelligence for a long time already. We're used of managing and dealing with huge amount of data. Uh, we have a 700, nearly a billion people using our data every day to navigate. We have a huge amount of data and we can just keep that data current. So the next step is really uh, urban revolution will change. Our cities, you know, the problem is huge. People get killed on the road every day. Uh, our cities are congested. Pollution is immense. And I think there are some big problems to be solved there. And we feel that with the expertise that we have, uh, the way we can deal with that data uh, and that knowledge that we have, we can be a major technology player in this big revolution urban revolution of tomorrow, and that's super exciting for a company like us. So that's why I'm very optimistic for the future and the way that we've been able to anticipate, adapt, and working on cool technologies today. And that's the way we can attract also the best engineers in the world to keep and work with us on solving that problem. How did you transform the culture of a company which was essentially a B2C company? Um, to what I suppose now is increasingly a B2B company and to maintain the, the sort of the same culture, the same spirit. Um, how, how did you transition that from a, from a people perspective? I think in any companies, the, the culture is established by the founders or the people at the top. I think as leaders of an organization, you have a big responsibility towards your, the, the, and you have a big impact on the company culture. Mm -hmm. And for me, company culture is key. I mean, uh, if you're an entrepreneur, you know it's, it's very hard. Uh, you, you, there's a lot of rewards because you're in charge of your own destinies. You can take risk and change the world. At the same time, you need to be re resilient. So I'm a big... Yeah, I think that we managed to keep fun in the organization. We have a flat organization where everybody kind of works together towards a big goal. I travel to all our offices around the world and I see that same entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, we encourage our people to innovate every day. So we don't have an innovation officer or an innovation office. Uh, we just innovate uh, towards our goal in a, in a daily fashion and, uh, and try to, do the, to use the best technology that we have. So I think we've managed to keep uh, that entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, we have fun doing what we're doing. Uh, and, uh, and I must say, I have a very loyal team that uh, for a long time, we don't have a high level of attrition. And uh, so we, we, and we, yeah, we, we get people to, to, to join our dream and uh, in solving those problems. Is it unusual that I believe the same four co-founders are all still together Yes. roughly in the same positions 26 years later. And how key was that? And also, how difficult is it to keep people who, again, have been, been there for 26 years when you've had to evolve and pivot the company so much? 
Well, I think as leaders, I mean, we were having this uh, launch earlier on where we're discussing the, uh, you know, the, the reason why you run companies. And I think it's never money. I mean, uh, we, we went public in 2005, uh, yeah, 12 years ago, uh, and, and we could have retired. Uh, the reason we kept going is because we felt we were on a mission. And I think people in the organization mm -hmm. believe that with us, that we're on the mission to, to make the world a little bit of a better place. And I know it sounds a bit cliche, but we really believe that with the expertise, the experience that we have, we can do that. And I suppose as founders, that's what gets us out of bed every day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and in, when times are hard and when you, know, you get disrupted, the belief that you can make a difference that you can take the right level of risk uh, and that you can change things is, a, is actually that responsibility and that passion is, is very important. And I think for any entrepreneurs with any uh, problem you're trying to solve, and I just wish you to, uh, to have that same level of, of eagerness in trying to, to change things. If you look at where TomTom Tom was maybe 25 years ago, I'm sure you could never have envisioned the success that came but then maybe you couldn't have envisioned where the company eventually ended up. But do you now start to have an idea when you look at the future where you want TomTom Tom to be? Do you have a vision sort of 10 years in advance? Or with the size of company, do you still tend to look at getting to milestones? As you say, with the, the devices, you knew that they were, they were going to exist for a certain period. There was a lifespan to them. Now, do you tend to look a long way forward or do you tend to look to specific hurdles? I think you have big mood shoots. I think when you look at autonomous driving and a lot of companies around here that are working on, on their parts in making that, that urban revolution possible, uh, we don't know where it's going to end up. And there are a lot of companies going to arrive in the next, uh, you know, autonomous driving will be around mm -hmm. fully autonomous 10, 15 years. So I think that's, that's how far we look at. Mm. We know that things will change and, and that we, uh, we can contribute. And I think mm. that's the way we look at it. So we look, we have milestone, of course. Yes. Uh, we are, uh, our, our map making tools and our real time map making tools is, we have milestone within the organization, but uh, the, the, the way to get there is not always straight. So I think you always need to get that light on the horizon. Of what is the problem you're trying to solve? And that is your role in that, uh, in that revolution. Mm. I think it makes for a lot of very good metaphors, the journey of TomTom. Tom. As essentially a company then that, that is, as I, say, I, I said at the start, it's like a 26-year-old startup, given that it keeps restarting and restarting. It pivots and pivots. And that the pivot is often such a fundamental part of any startup's journey. What would you advise for, for companies as they see success or as they have to change their business models? The things that can sideswipe them in either the early days or as happened with you at the piece of success, you can get sideswiped and move on. What would your advice be to companies when they have to make that kind of hard decision? I think as companies, as entrepreneurs, I think you have a very good idea of the problem, you, you, what you're trying to do. I think it's, you've got to have that belief in yourself. I mean, entrepreneurs, we, you know, it's not a job, it's a lifestyle. Huh? Mm. So you work day in, day out in trying to, to get where you, you want to go. And I think sometimes you tend to get a lot of advice from everyone. I think that uh, uh, while adv advice is welcome and uh, I think, you know, to get mentoring is good, but never lose sight that you know more about your organization than anyone. Mm. You know why you're doing it. So if you keep an eye on the competitive landscape or what's happening, uh, it's important to also follow your gut feel and your intuition. Mm. At the same time, you need to be aware that you can get disrupted. So mm. you need to also look broad at, uh, at mm. your level of competence, the, the technologies you develop, the IP you're filing. I think it's very important as well to look at the mm. uniqueness of what you do. Uh, we file a huge amount of IP. That's the other thing when you scale as well. When you get big, you've got lots of trolls. If you start doing business in the US especially, you need to make sure you have a good patent portfolio. But uh, I think that's, um, yeah, the, the, the key is, uh, is to really believe in yourself, believe in the problem you're solving, keep at it, uh, and, and look and book small successes along the way that validate your, uh, your assumptions as well to make sure that your customers uh, buy in your product, that your, we get a lot of feedback, of course, from our customer. We're always listening, trying to see how we can make things better. But I think the drive is how, how can we make things better? I think it's always there in the back of your mind. So you get to one stage and there must be a better way of doing this. There must be a better way of doing this. And then you innovate, you take risks and you get there. Because if you don't, essentially, if, if you don't disrupt yourself, other people will disrupt you. Yes, that's true. And along the way, we, we've launched a lot of uh, 
you know, before Uber came, we, we had a, a similar product. Uh, we, we based a platform for taxis, and uh, uh, Europe is complex sometimes, a lot of regulatory, so we, uh, we launched this product and we had to pull it out. So sometimes you do things and sometimes it doesn't work, but I think it's good to, uh, to try and keep trying, uh, yeah, and keep taking risks. Corinne, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> We go off.